electrolytic cells and electroplating. So we've already, already talked a bit about electrochemical cells in the context of both electrolytic and galvanic cells and talking about some basic definitions. There are a couple of differences that warrant a bit more coverage on the electrolytic cell part, um, especially as related to one particular application, which we're going to cover a little bit in this video and then a little bit in the next video. In this video, we're going to remind you of the main definitional difference between electrolytic and galvanic cells, and then talk a bit about how this concept can change the setup of the cell itself in a way that just isn't really possible with a galvanic cell. Well, remember how to determine the products of reaction and then relate all these concepts to electroplating. This is a very, very important application of electrolytic cells that's going to be discussed a bit further in the next video. As a quick reminder, an electrolytic cell is one that requires an outside source of power, or in other words, it is a non-spontaneous reaction. This power could be from another cell. So for instance, you could power one cell with a battery, which is just another electrochemical cell, or it may be from an outside source such as wall outlets, and then wherever the power that you're getting from that wall outlet is coming from. So unlike a galvanic cell, which normally needs to be separated with some sort of salt bridge, often in different containers, um, sometimes they can get away with different membranes for this, but there, there's usually some sort of separation. Because electrolytic cells require a supply of energy, the reaction only occurs at the area where the electricity flow is coming in. And so you actually don't need to separate them, um, though they can be. It's just not absolutely necessary. Um, even within these, though, the reactions and the nomenclature are the same. So reduction is still occurring at the cathode, and there's still a little bit of separation between the cathode and the anode. And then the anode is where the oxidation takes place. That's true regardless of whether it's in galvanic or an electrolytic, regardless of whether it's kind of in one pot or two. Um, reduction is always at the cathode, and anode is always the oxidation. Now, all the formulas that we have that interrelay E, K, and G that we talked about in previous videos, they're still valid. That doesn't change. Now, since specifically this is non-spontaneous, that means that for an electrolytic cell, E is going to be negative, and then G would be positive. So that's kind of specifically related to this, but it follows all the same rules in general um, that we always think of for our reactions. Now we're gonna discuss electroplating as our application. Um, there's a lot of other ones as well. So I'm just gonna mention this here and then we're gonna talk a little bit more about why this is necessary in the next video. Electroplating is something that's um, used frequently to either protect a substance or change the look or properties of a substance. For example, perhaps you want your silverware to be actual silver but it turns out that this is quite expensive and perhaps you don't want to actually spend the money for real silverware. A cheaper option to do this would be to get silverware that is not actually made out of solid silver, but is just plated in silver. This would put a thin layer of silver over top of a different cheaper metal so that you get the appearance of silver without the cost. This is commonly done with gold jewelry as well um, so that you can this for two reasons, actually, one for looks and also for strength, because gold is pretty weak. Um, but there's also less frivolous examples. So, for instance, the need to make a species less likely to be corroded. Um, the metal used for making the parts may be prone to react with water, and electrolyting can put a layer of non-reactive species on top to stop this corrosion. And this is going to be gone into in a lot more detail in the next video. So in electroplating, both the anode and the cathode are undergoing a half reaction involving the same metal. So on one side, it's being oxidized from the metal into the solution, into an ion. And then on the other side, it's being reduced and then plated out on the species. So in this example here, we have silver metal being oxidized from this bar of silver. It goes into the solution, and then it's being plated out on the cathode. The thickness of the plating can be varied by changing the voltage or the time um, that's used to plate it. And we're going to talk about that right now. So I want us to do a couple of examples of this. These problems can be done completely using dimensional analysis to figure out the appropriate unit that will be your answer. So try pausing the video and then coming back when you've attempted it, or even just spend some time thinking about the problem and, and looking at how the um, units work with this. As with some of the other videos, I think that a problem like this is best done written out very slowly by hand um, in a way in which I'm interacting with you. And so the easiest way for me to actually do that in a way that feels real is to cut my um, lecture videos in. So I'm gonna do that here for these two problems. Okay, 
the calculations for electroplating. If you, we're not gonna, we're gonna stay away from any sort of geometry. This actually does become a bit of a geometry problem with, with coding surface area. So we're gonna always kind of stop at grams. But you do wanna be able to do calculations for these sorts of things to decide how much do you actually want to put on that thing. You know, if you're selling something, you, you're selling a fork and someone uses it one time and now suddenly the nice silver plating is off, they're not gonna be very happy. So you want a certain thickness. Again, you get into geometry problems, so we're not gonna go there, but the first step is to calculate the grams. And so that's what we're gonna stick with. So this is massive dimensional analysis and that's pretty much it. There's no real equations to memorize here. There are some things you have to know and have to know that you know. So for one, a coulomb. A coulomb is an amp times a second, okay? Keep that in, in your mind. Whenever you think coulomb, think amp times second. And whenever you're doing these dimensional, dimension, or whenever you're doing these electroplating examples, you may even wanna just like jot this down off to the side. Honestly, I still jot this down off to the side. And remember Faraday's constant. That is 96,485 coulombs per mole. If you want to be a little bit more specific there, and usually I do this when I'm doing these problems, it's coulombs per mole of electrons. Okay, you may want to write that down next to it, moles of electrons. The other things to make sure that you know that you know, if you are given the substance, you know the species, you know how many, you know it's grams per moles, right? You're always going to know the molecular mass of anything that I give you the name of. And one other thing you know, if I give you the species, you know it's oxidation numbers, okay? You know it's charges, these are metals. And because you know it's charges, you know how many electrons it takes to change it from, in this case, let's go, I think I have a nickel there. So from nickel to plus to nickel solid or vice versa. You know that. You know the charge and so you know the moles of electrons. Once you know that you know all of those things, it becomes, let's play with units. Start somewhere and see where you go. Of aluminum can be deposited by the passage of 105 coulombs through an electrolytic cell. All right? So we have our coulombs and we're trying to get to grams. Don't feel like you have to have a nice pretty plan on what you're gonna do when you get started here. Eventually, you'll, once you do a bunch of them, you'll get a feel for it. But in the beginning, we can just say, okay, well, I have 105 coulombs. And I would like to get to grams. Of aluminum. Now, we'll play around with conversion factors. So things that we know here, we'll write those up top. We know Faraday's constant. We know that. We know our molar mass of aluminum. We get that from our periodic table. We know that one amp times seconds equals one coulomb. We know that. Okay. Well, coulombs on its own isn't really gonna get me anywhere. So let's see if we can do anything by moving it to amp per second. We want to use Faraday's constant. We have our moles of electrons now. There's one other thing that I didn't write down that we know that we know. And that's how we get from moles of electrons to moles of our species. Because moles of our electrons we can't use grams per mole on. If you do that you're going to get the wrong answer, right? Because that's moles of your species. But what charge does aluminum like to have? likes to have a three plus. To go from aluminum solid, which is a charge of zero, to a charge, or to aluminum three plus, which is a charge of three, how many electrons have to move around? Three. So we can add that to things we know. Aluminum likes to have a three plus. So now we put our three moles of electrons to our one mole of aluminum. Well, we're getting closer because now if I told you that I have a certain moles of aluminum and you need grams of aluminum, you would know what to do, right? You use molar mass. Like that. And we cancel everything out to make sure we're okay. Should be, but it's a good thing to do. And we're all set. 
So we plug in and we get our number. Now, did I know where I was going with this? Yeah, sure. But you may not when you start. Usually, if you just keep using those conversion factors, it'll work. The only big mistake that generally will happen sometimes if you just start at a really random place, when you get done, you end up with like one over grams or something weird like that. If you end up with one over grams, what do you do to fix it? You just invert the number and you're okay. It doesn't happen a lot, but I, I've seen people kind of start from funny places and it ends up doing something weird like that, but generally it's okay. Generally, you can pick a number that you know and work with what you have and you'll be all right. The next one that we're going to do um, is going to show us how to use amps in there as well. Because in this case, I just said, okay, I have a certain number of coulombs. Let's see how many grams I get. But sometimes you're going to have a system where you can only run it at a certain amount of amps. That whatever power supply you have is going to apply this amount of amp, and you need to just be able to run it for a certain amount of time. Time, the second one is actually a much more realistic version of the calculation that you would do. Um, where you have a system, you know how many amps it puts in, you know what you're plating, and you just need to see, okay, I'm going to set this up to go, how long should I set the timer for? So how long does it take to deposit 0.63 grams of nickel on a decorative drawer handle when 8.7 amps are passed through a nickel nitrate solution? Okay. So you have the thing that you want to plate, you know you want to plate it with nickel, and you just want to see how long do I need to run it for. You know your power supply, what its process is, and you know this. This, for the record, is where the geometry part comes in that we're not going to go into because you'd have to actually be like, okay, well, I want it to be this thick. I know that my surface area is this, and so on and so forth. But I will trust that you all know how to do that from your other classes, and we won't do it here. The laugh did not make me feel good about you knowing. <laughs> but I'll assume it was at a cat video you're watching instead. Okay, so we know this, we always have this. We know our molecular mass. We know our coulombs to amps. We know nickel, I'm, I'm going to put this a little bit in quotes, we know nickel is a 2 plus. Um, this was one that I wasn't actually 100% sure if you might know that nickel was a 2 plus, so I helped you out a little bit. What did I do? I told you what solution it's in, right? You don't really need to know the solution to answer this problem. You need to know the solution when you actually go to run it. There are some things you have to be careful of to pick. You didn't need it to do this problem. The reason I put that in there is so that you could figure out the charge on nickel. What's the charge on nitrate? The charge on nitrate is a minus one, which means the charge on nickel is a plus two. So to go from nickel to a nickel two plus, how many electrons are moving around? Two. Okay, the point of all this is just so that we have in our heads what we have to work with, right? We may use all of it, we may use only a few things, but at least we know that that's our collection of things that we know about this system. Now we're going to try to go from grams to time. You may not know where to start, that's, or you may not know how you're going to get there, I should say. But you do kind of know where to start. Start with your 0.63 grams. Start with your given. We know we're trying to get to time. You may not really know where you're going. We would like to get to seconds, but we can't get to seconds. So what if we could get to coulombs? Well, we're not to coulombs yet either, but what if we could get to moles of electrons? Well, we could almost get to moles of electrons, if we had moles of what? Nickel, right? If we have moles of nickels, we can get to moles of electrons. Okay.
I'm going to put moles of nickel here just so we're clear. All right. Well, now that we have moles of nickel, we can get to moles of electrons. Where does the two go? Does it go in front of the electrons or the nickel? The electrons, right? Because we need two moles of electrons to move to get one mole of nickel. All right. So now we have moles of electrons. We're getting closer because now we can get to coulombs and we know that coulombs are really just an amp times a second and we at least have the unit that we want, right? And we just kind of fingers crossed at the moment to hope that it ends up in the numerator. If it doesn't, if we've done something where it ends up in the denominator, that's okay. We can fix it at the end. This time the 96485 goes on top because it's staying with the coulombs. We'll switch the coulombs into amps times seconds so that we have seconds there. So now we're getting closer. Now there might be a temptation right now to stop, solve for the answer and be done. But let's look at what happens if we do that. Our grams cancel, our moles of nickel cancel, our electrons cancel, our coulombs can cancel, and what do we have? Amps times seconds. That's not what we want. We want seconds. So we need to use amps here to get rid of that. Right now, where is amps? Top or bottom? Top. How do you cancel out something that's in the top? You divide it. I'm not 100% sure why. People don't tend to like to do this, but you can. You can always just stick a one there in unit list. It'd be the same thing as just saying divide by. Um, so we'll, we'll do that. You could also, if you really don't like that, just go divide by amps. This is a little cleaner. So now our amps cancel, and we have seconds. So don't get hung up with these if you don't know exactly where you're going to end up. Worst case scenario, you make a wrong turn on one of the conversion factors and you have to start over real quick. It's not the end of the world. Could I have started with amps? I could have. That's an example of where if you do start with amps, when you get done, you're going to end up with an inverse second and you just have to go one over your answer to get it in the correct units again. But you could have started with amps and worked your way through as well. I think grams is easier. In review, electrolytic cells require power to be supplied to them because they are a non-spontaneous reaction. This allows them to be contained within one container because the anode and the cathode are occurring at different electrodes within the solution. Electroplating is one way that we can harness this to protect certain metals from corrosion or coat a cheaper metal with something that is, looks more expensive and looks nicer um, for looks purposes. And in the next video, we're going to talk a bit more about um, the specifics of corrosion and galvanizing and using electrolytic cells to protect species.